Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we will be talking about Intel Corporation. Intel is one of the leading manufacturers of integrated circuits. Today, we will briefly go over the company's 10K annual report to get a better idea of its business segments. Then we'll look at the company's fundamentals by reviewing the company's key ratios. We'll perform a discounted fee cash flow DCF analysis to find the intrinsic value of Intel. And finally, do an expected rate of return calculation to see if you were to invest in Intel at the current stock price, what kind of return can we expect on this investment? So let's dive in and review Intel Corporation. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that Intel Corporation filed with the SEC. This is for the fiscal year that ended December 26, 2020. And on page 4 of the report, the company says that it is an industry leader and a catalyst for technology innovation and products that revolutionize the way we live. Intel is committed to harnessing the breadth and scale of its reach to have a positive effect on business, society, and the planet. Intel says that its purpose is to create world-changing technology that enriches the lives of every person on Earth, and its vision is to be the trusted performance leader that unleashes the potential of data. On page 8 of this report, Intel talks about its strategy. Intel says that we are now entering the era of distributed intelligence where computing is pervasive and so many things in our lives, our homes, our cars, our hospitals and our cities now function like computers. The three fastest growing opportunities are AI, 5G network transformation and the intelligent and autonomous edge. Intel claims that it has a history of transforming to capitalize on market shift and it is actually in the midst of another significant transformation to position itself and its customers for growth. With Intel's focus on execution and re-energized culture as a force multiplier, Intel is transforming from a CPU to multi-architecture XPU company, from silicon to platforms, and from a traditional IDM to a new modern IDM. Next, Intel's priorities are to improve execution to strengthen its core, extend its reach to accelerate its growth, and redefine its position in the industry. Intel has six operating segments. It talks about its first operating segment on page 22, the first one being the data center group, Intel says that the data center group develops workload optimized platforms for compute, storage, and network functions. Its market segments include cloud service providers, enterprise and government, and communication service providers. Intel says that the revenue for this segment grew by 11% as the cloud service providers increased their capacity to serve customer demand. When we look at the past five year trend for this segment, we can see that the data center group segment has seen an increase in its revenue every year for the past five years. Ideally, we want to see the segment's operating income to have a similar trend and growth as the segment's revenue. However, when we see a divergence in the segment's operating income when compared to that of the segment's revenue, we can safely say that for that calendar year, the segment was unable to keep its cost of goods and operating expenses in check. Intel discusses its second operating segment on page 25, which is its Internet of Things segment. Intel says that its Internet of Things portfolio is comprised of its IoTG and Mobilize segment. The Internet of Things group, that is the IoTG segment, develops high-performance compute platforms that solve for technology and businesses use cases that can scale across vertical industries and embedded markets. Intel's customers in the IoTG segment include retailers, manufacturers, health and life sciences, government and education providers. Intel says that the revenue for this segment was down 21% due to the economic impact of COVID-19. And the revenue was also negatively affected by considerations related to the U.S. government entity list. Next, the past five-year trend showed that from 2016 through 2019, the segment's revenue had been increasing. And then we saw a decline in the year 2020 due to the above-mentioned reasons. The segment's operating income saw a similar trend as the revenue. On page 27, Intel talks about its third operating segment, which is its mobilized segment. Intel claims that Mobileye is the global leader in driving assistance and self-driving solutions. Its product portfolio employs a broad set of technologies covering computer vision and machine learning based sensing, data analysis, localization, mapping and driving policy technology. Intel states that this segment saw a record revenue in the year 2020. We can see that the segment's revenue as well as operating income have been trending upwards over the past four years. Intel talks about its fourth operating segment on page 30, which is its non-volatile memory solutions group. The NSG Group provides next-generation memory and storage products based on breakthrough Intel Optane technology and Intel 3D NAND technology. The NSG segment is disrupting memory and storage hierarchy with new tiers that balance capacity, performance, and cost. The customers of this segment include enterprise and cloud-based data centers and users of business and consumer desktops and laptops. The NSG segment also achieved record revenue in the year 2020. We can see that even though the segment's revenue have been growing every year for the past five years, 
it is unable to keep its cost of goods and operating expenses low, which is causing this segment's operating income to be rather subpar. Intel talks about its fifth operating segment on page 33, which is its Programmable Solutions Group. The PSG segment offers programmable semiconductors, primarily FPGAs, structured ASICs, and related products for a broad range of applications across Intel's embedded communications and cloud and enterprise market segments. Intel states that this segment's revenue was down 7% year over year, driven by a decline in its communications market segment due to customer transition to 5G SICs and decline in its embedded market segment. Next, looking at the past five-year trend, we can see that this segment's revenue increased from 2016 all the way through 2018. However, since 2018, the segment's revenue have been decreasing. The segment's operating income has stayed fairly consistent over the past few years. Intel talks about its last operating segment on page 36, which is its client computing group. For this segment, Intel states that working with its partners across the industry, it intends to continue to advance PC experiences. As the largest business unit at Intel, the client computing group is investing more heavily in the PC, ramping its capabilities even more aggressively, and designing the PC experience even more deliberately, including delivering a predictable cadence of leadership products. Intel states that this segment delivered its fifth consecutive year of revenue growth to $40.1 billion as the PC became even more essential part of people's lifestyle due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, looking at the past five-year trends, as above mentioned, the segment's revenue saw growth every year for the past five years. However, when we look at the segment's operating income, we can see that the segment's operating income saw growth every year from 2016 through 2019. The segment's operating income saw a decline in the year 2020. This is interesting because even though the company's revenue saw growth, we saw a decline in the revenue, which is driven by the fact that the company was unable to keep the segment's cost of goods and operating expenses in check. Finally, on page 86, the company sums up its operating segments. We can see that the company has six operating segments, the DCG, IOTG, Mobileye, NSG, PSG, and CCG segments. On the next page, Intel breaks down its revenue across these operating segments. We can see that the data center group segment and the client computing group segment makes a majority of the company's total net revenue. Similarly, when it comes to operating income, the data center group and the client computing group makes a majority of the company's total operating income. Now that we have a brief understanding of Intel's business, its six operating segments and its revenue breakdown, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, now let's look at the key ratios for Intel Corporation. I'm on Morningstar looking at Intel under key ratios. We have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, Intel's revenue was about $54 billion. And for the year 2020, it was about $78 billion. Intel's revenue over the past 10 years has been trending upwards. Next is the operating income. The operating income is what we get when we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, Intel's operating income was about $17 billion, and for the year 2020, it's about $24 billion. Intel's operating income has slowly been trending upwards over the past few years. After that, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations and taxes. Back in 2011, Intel's net income was about $13 billion, and for the year 2020, it was about $21 billion. Intel's net income over the past 10 years has always been positive, which tells us that the company always reported a profit. Ideally, we want to see the company's net income to be positive, staying steady or increasing. And we can see that Intel's net income stayed in the $9 to $12 billion range from 2011 all the way through 2017. And then we saw a jump up in the year 2018, and it has hovered in the $20 billion range ever since. Next is the dividends per share. Back in 2011, Intel paid out about $0.78 cent per share as dividend. And for the chilling 12 months, it paid out about $1.34 per share as dividend. Ideally, we want to invest in companies that pays out consistent and regular dividends. And we can see that Intel has been hiking its dividends every year for the past 10 years, except the one year in 2014 when it kept its dividend payouts the same as the previous year. After that, looking at the shares outstanding, back in 2011, Intel had 5,411 million shares outstanding. And for the chilling 12 months, it has 4,178 million shares outstanding. We can see that Intel has been buying back its shares every year for the past 10 years as its share counts have been decreasing. That is certainly something that we want to see as shareholders as this process of buybacks actually helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. 
Next, looking at the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the total liabilities from the company's total assets. Back in 2011, the company's book value was about $9.22 per share. And for the trailing 12 months, it's about $21 per share. Ideally, we want to see the company's book value per share to be staying steady or increasing. A positive book value per share tells us that the company always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. We can see that Intel's book value per share has always been positive and has been increasing every year for the past 10 years. Finally, looking at the free cash flow. The free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2011, Intel's free cash flow was about $10 billion. And for the year 2020, it's about $21 billion. Ideally, we want to see the company's free cash flow to be positive, staying steady or increasing. And we can see that Intel's free cash flow has always been positive and consistent over the past 10 years. I will be using the past 10 years of free cash flows from my expected rate of return calculation. And I will be using the 2020 figure of $20,931 million from my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line. So it's a ratio of the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 23.97%. And for the year 2020, it was about 26.84%. So what this 2020 net margin number means is that every $100 that Intel made from sales in the year 2020, by the time it paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations and taxes, it had $26.84 left as pure profit. After that, looking at the return on equity, the return on equity is the ratio of the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, Intel's return on equity was about 27%, and for the year 2020, it was about 26%. We can see that every year for the past 10 years, Intel's return on equity has been greater than 8%. Next, looking at the return on invested capital. The return on invested capital gives an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was about 25%, and for the year 2020, it's about 19%. Intel's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 4.5%. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that the management is creating value for its shareholders. Finally, looking at the interest coverage. The interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had interest coverage of five times or higher. Back in 2011, Intel's interest coverage was about 435 times. And for the year 2020, it's about 41 times. Now let's look at the financial health of the company. Looking at the liquidity ratios, the first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company has enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. It's even better if the company's current ratio is greater than 1.5. Back in 2011, Intel's current ratio was about 2.15, and for the latest quarter, it's about 1.9. We can see that Intel's current ratio for majority of the past 10 years has been greater than 1.5. Next, looking at the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was about 1.53, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.23. Next is the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2011, Intel's financial leverage was about 1.55, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.89. Intel's financial leverage has slowly been trending upwards over the past 10 years. Finally, looking at the debt to equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want to see the company's debt to equity ratio to be less than 1. It's even better if it's less than 0.5. Back in 2011, the company's debt to equity ratio was at 0.15, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.42. Intel's financial leverage and debt to equity ratios are comparable to its competitors AMD and Nvidia. Now, let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. The day sales outstanding number gives an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sale to the date it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2011, Intel's day sales outstanding was about 22 days, and for the year 2020, it was about 34 days. 
Ideally, we want the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. An increasing day sales outstanding number tells us that the company may be aggressive with its accounting as it's trying to recognize its sales sooner so that it can report an inflated income number on its income statement. Intel's day sales outstanding number has stayed fairly consistent over the past few years. Next, looking at the day's inventory, this number gives us an idea of how many days does Intel's products sit in its inventory before they're sold. Back in 2011, Intel's products sat in its inventory for about 71 days, and for the year 2020, it was about 91 days. Ideally, we want to see the company's day's inventory to be staying steady or decreasing. We can see that from 2011 through 2020, the company's day's inventory number has increased. However, compared to 2019, the company's day's inventory number in the year 2020 has decreased. After that, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does Intel take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, it took Intel about 47 days to pay its suppliers. And for the year 2020, it took about 52 days to pay its suppliers. Ideally, we want the company's payable spirit to be staying steady or decreasing. However, an increasing payable spirit tells us that the company may be artificially trying to inflate its cash flow numbers by holding on to its cash. Finally, looking at the inventory turnover, this number gives an idea of how many times does Intel go through its inventory in a calendar year. Back in 2011, Intel went through its inventory about 5.16 times, and for the year 2020, it went through its inventory about 4 times. Ideally, we want the company's inventory turnover to be staying steady or increasing. However, in the case of Intel, the company's inventory turnover has been trending downwards. Now let's compare the company's current valuation to that of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Intel's PE is 11.8, whereas S&P 500 is at 26.5. Intel's price to book is at 2.5, whereas S&P 500 is at 4.4. Intel's price to sales is at 2.8, whereas S&P 500 is at 3.2. Intel's price to cash flow is at 6.8, whereas S&P 500 is at 17.6. And finally, dividend yield. Intel's dividend yield is about 2.6%, and S&P 500's yield is about 1.5%. We can see that on all these valuation metrics, Intel is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Hey guys, now let's look at Intel's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted the company's 2020 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which is at $20,931 million. I'm using an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 6%. What this means is I expect Intel's free cash flow to grow at 6% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I expect this investment to give me a 10% return. I'm using a long-term growth rate of 3%. What this means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect Intel's free cash flow to grow at 3%. The company has 4,178 million shares outstanding and has a long-term debt of $33,897 million. I got this number from the company's balance sheet. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $82 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to Intel's current stock price, which is at $53 per share, we can see that the current stock price is trading about 0.65 times the company's intrinsic value. In other words, the company's current stock price is trading about 35% below its intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows which come out to about $172 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark into perpetuity. We sum all those up and get the intrinsic value to be about $377 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $82. Now, if we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that Intel is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $33 per share. Now, if we disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that Intel is going to grow into perpetuity so there is no point for the company to worry about its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $90 per share. Hey guys, now let's look at Intel's expected rate of return calculation. Over here, I pasted the company's past 10 years of free cash flows that I got from Morningstar. All the numbers here are in millions of US dollars. This is the early free cash flow trend that we get over the years. We can see that the free cash flows have been trending upwards over the past 10 years. Next, looking at the future data and predictions, I'm assuming that there's a 35% likelihood that Intel's free cash flow will grow at 9% a 50% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 6%, and a 15% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 3%. These are the potential free cash flow arrays that we get into the future. After taking into account the numbers of shares outstanding, which is at 4,178 million shares, at the current stock price of about $53 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 13.5% on this investment. 
What this means is if you were to purchase a share of Intel at the current stock price of about $53 per share and hold this security through 2060, then we can expect to get an annual return of about 13.5% on this investment. Hey guys, now let's wrap it all up. We briefly went over Intel's 10K annual report to get a better idea of its business. We saw that Intel has six operating segments and the two business segments that bring in majority of the company's revenue are its data center group and the client computing group segments. We saw that Intel's revenue has been trending upwards over the past 10 years and its operating income and net income has stayed fairly consistent over the past few years. For majority of the past 10 years, Intel has been hiking its dividends. Additionally, the company has been buying back its shares every year for the past 10 years. Both these actions of paying dividends and buying back shares are very shareholder friendly. Next we saw that the company's return on equity has always been greater than 8% and its return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital which tells us that the company's management is creating value for its shareholders. We also saw that the company's interest coverage has always been greater than 5 times. When we looked at the company's current and quick ratios, we saw that the company has more than enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. In other words, the company has enough oxygen in its system to survive for another 12 months. Intel's financial leverage and debt-to-equity ratios point out that the company is not over-leveraged. In fact, Intel's financial leverage and debt-to-equity ratios are comparable to its competitors NVIDIA and AMD. When we looked at the efficiency ratios, we saw that Intel was a lot better at going through its inventory 10 years ago than it is today. Next, we compared Intel's current valuation to that of the S&P 500 and found that on all the valuation metrics, Intel was undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Next, we looked at the company's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis and found that when we used a 10% discount rate, the company's intrinsic value came to about $82 per share, which would indicate that the company's current stock price is trading about 35% below the company's intrinsic value. When we performed the expected rate of return calculation, we found out that if we were to purchase a share of Intel at the current stock price of about $53 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 13.5% on this investment. Intel is in a very cutthroat industry. It constantly has to innovate in order to maintain its competitive advantage. For the year 2020, Intel spent about 17% of its sales towards research and development. Despite some temporary hiccups associated with its chip technology and manufacturing, Intel is fundamentally a strong company and has a long roadway of growth ahead. And lastly, I have been an Intel shareholder since 2017. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Intel interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.